the first episode of the podcast that is all things comics, all things Star Wars, George Lucas all the time. And this is what we're doing today. And I am your host, Mr. The Prequels. We are introducing a new line of thinking and conversation where all fans of Star Wars and everything comics, everyone is welcome. George Lucas all the time. George Lucas is the key. And Jar Jar Binks is the key. And as we look at the prequels, Star Wars, all things comics, George Lucas all the time, we'll be examining the philosophy of various philosophies as interpreted through the text by, as has been provided to us by George Lucas and all of the collaborators that he works with and work with and then all of the ways of thinking that have been infused into Star Wars as Star Wars is can be seen as a, a myth text a, a, a text on a religious text a sacred text if you will but it is a way of looking at the world is what it is and you have episodes one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then all of the various other Star Wars that comes from that, surrounds it. Surrounds it, all of that. As other creators have taken their own interpretation or wishes or agendas, whatever it is, to make Star Wars what they will have it be. And in the way they wish others to see it along with them and so we're looking at the prequels and we're looking at the original trilogy as each its own category its own set the prequels episodes one two and three the original trilogy episodes four five and six but then also we're going to look at all of these episodes as the complete saga as provided to us by the creator and the master of this universe, George Lucas. Episodes one through six, including the holiday special, the original holiday special, and the Clone Wars, the original Clone Wars, the the, the first one, the miniseries. And And then the comics and the books that are authorized by the creator, George Lucas, as we'll know by his words recorded in both both audiovisual and written or printed form. We'll know which of these the master creator approves of, authorizes. And then there are other aspects of Star Wars too, of one's own interpretation of what the creator has provided. George Lucas is the creator of all things in this universe. We are the stewards of that and also the encounterers of that. We encounter these things. As we engage each other in this universe, Star Wars, episodes one through six, we we have a way of speaking, a way of thinking, and a way of communicating in many ways that it that these ways are foreign to 99% of the population that you meet in civilized society, so to speak. But, nonetheless, and at the same time, it is ubiquitous in our society, as much so as is Coca-Cola, or Santa Claus, or Cinderella, or Mickey Mouse. And that is what Star Wars is. It's a fairy tale. It's a fantastical science fiction novella. 
It is a chapter in the life of many people now listening to this. As you encountered this and at some point in your life became a different person and based on this, this myth, this story. And what you did with that and what you do with it is who you are because of George Lucas. And so we will celebrate the creation of George Lucas, but we celebrate and thank and pay tribute to in both our well, in way of wishing well to, towards and giving him our money, George Lucas. And so we're going to be looking at all of these parts of Star Wars and ourselves too as we see each other in the mirror and through the refracted lens of Star Wars. We're going to have a great time. We're going to laugh. We're going to possibly cry in a good way. And then we will talk about all things comics, all things Star Wars, George Lucas all the time. Heroes Unite. And I'm your host, Mr. The Prequels. May the Force be with us. See you next time. The Prequels by George Lucas. The Star Wars Prequels by George Lucas. These are the stories, the story, the beginning of the story, as we saw the original trilogy starting in 1977, many of us saw it in theaters for the first time, and then in 1999, The Phantom of Menace, and we're looking at the prequels as a text, as individual patterns emerge, and as also characters, and a special effects, camera, lighting, audio, and all of that. And we're going to be looking at the prequels from the point of view of approaching a sacred text provided to us by the creator, George Lucas, and his followers, the prophets, if you will, the directors, the movie makers, those that have brought together the stories and created movies out of these ideas that George Lucas gave us. And we're studying the prequels as a text, a sacred text, if you will with characters, an agenda, of course, the author, why did the author write the story, who is the audience, and what is the purpose of the story, to tell what, and according to what point of view and in what frame. And of course, when you take a look at the original trilogy, you have the story of Luke Skywalker, along with Leia Skywalker, and then, of course, Darth Vader, who is the father of Luke Skywalker and the father of Leia Skywalker as Luke and Leia are twins, brother and sister. It's the story of redemption. It's the story of fathers, sons, daughters, generations. But how did they get there? How did we get to this point? As we saw in the original trilogy, beginning with episode four. And then we see in episode one, the beginning, and that is the story of Anakin. As Anakin begins his journey to become a Jedi, and then ultimately to turn to the dark side. And as George Lucas said, and this is the words of the creator, paraphrasing of course, it's the story of the fathers, sons, generations, and so on, but how also good people turn bad, and what factors human emotion plays in that, including greed, jealousy, anger, fear, and so on. George Lucas is the master, he's the creator of this story. We are the recipients of this story, of these tales, tales of the Jedi, so to speak, tales of those that have gone on into the Force, the netherworld, so to speak. And then, of course, we look and see all of the characters that are around us supporting this story and these other characters as they go about their function is to tell the story of father, fathers, sons, daughters, generations. And then, of course, we meet Obi-Wan Kenobi in Episode 4, the original trilogy, and Han Solo, Chewbacca, Princess Leia, as we said, and then some other characters as we come along here, C-3PO, R2-D2, and then we're introduced to the, the world of Star Wars. In the original trilogy, we're introduced to the world of Star Wars, and then of course in episodes one through three, this world is fleshed out, built out, built up, so that we can see the layout of this world, the texture, the various characters that are living in this world, and what their motivations are. And then in episode one, you see, we see the Republic. In episode four, we see civil war, the rebellion against the Empire. 
And then, of course, in episode one, this is the prequels, we see the Republic, the functioning democracy, and how this process leads to a dictatorship, tyranny, and the actual death of liberty. And we'll see all of this as we meet in episodes one through three, Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi, again, we see Obi-Wan Kenobi, we meet him for the first time in this one, Anakin Skywalker, who, as we know later, will be the father of Luke Skywalker and Leia Skywalker, who are twins, Luke and Leia are twins. And then, of course, we have, again, we said Jar Jar Banks, who is the funniest character we've ever had in Star Wars, and he is, of course, the key to the prequels, to understanding this, as he is the funniest of all the characters. And whereas, as we've seen, seen the various characters in, in their spots in the story as they have been introduced to us, episode four, beginning with episode four, and then going to the beginning of episode one, episode two, and episode three. And these, we see some more of the original characters that we met, Obi-Wan, Kenobi, and then, of course, Luke's family, Luke Skywalker's family, and where they came from. George R. Binks, who's the key to all of this. This is the funniest character we've ever had in any of these movies. And then, of course, it's a very political process, a very political world, you see. And this is all explained in the prequels. And this is all laid out as an established world and an established order in the original trilogy. And then the special effects, the camera work, the lighting, the audio, and all of that serve to help move the story along and tell the story. So it's a fantastical story of humans, beings from other planets, aliens, if you will. And then, of course, the force, the living force, as we are introduced to this concept of the living force in the prequels. And then, of course, in the original trilogy, we see that the force is one thing, and then in the prequels, we see the Force is another thing, as explained. But we learn more about each of these aspects of the story upon the original trilogy, whether they be characters, or the Force, or the Empire, or the political process, or the world in which they live, the intergalactic travels and adventures that we see in the prequels is far beyond any idea that we saw that we could have in the original trilogy for a number of reasons. Number one, of course, this is episodes four through six. But number two, of course, very important, just as important, the technology to make these movies was whatever it was in 1976 and 77. And then the technology to make these movies was, of course, what it was in 1996, 97, and 98, as these movies were released in theaters. In 1999, you will see the technology to make these movies has changed, developed, grown, which gives the vision of the director, gives the director's vision more power as we see this vision being brought about before our very eyes and ears and so as we look at the prequels we see an empire yet to be born in the original trilogy we see a republic no more and in the prequels of course we see the jedi we see their culture we see their process we see their world we see the politics in which they engage and the world that they navigate to fulfill their mission as the jedi which is to be keepers of the peace and then, of course, we see the Sith in each of these aspects of the Force, the light side and the dark side, so to speak. The Force, the living Force, we learn about Jedi Masters, trainees, apprentices. And then, of course, we see Padawan learners. And then, of course, we have the weaponry, the tech of all of this going on. The wars, the civil wars, the politics, the manipulations, the greed. We see the Trade Federation. We see a whole new cast of players. And we see weapons being made, droids used as soldiers, clones being developed to serve the will of political personalities that are using the technology and the factors involved in this world to create a situation through which they will gain more power and have more control for various reasons and purposes and motivations to gain more power, to keep it, to hold it, and also to obtain peace and to bring about peace and order and stability and in the original trilogy we see the jedi are the good guys so to speak and in the prequels we see the jedi are the bad guys so to speak in the sense that we see how their arrogance their pride their rigid dogmatic approach to the force and the teaching surrounding being a jedi actually helped to create and support a culture that will eventually lead Anakin to the dark side, as well as other Jedi that we've seen, Count Dooku, and then later we see other characters in this story being taught the ways of the Force, although they might not be Jedi or Sith, such as General Grievous, 
And then we see the various aspects, the parts of the Jedi lifestyle, the Jedi mind trick, the politics, the Jedi council, the training, the younglings. And then we see in the prequels the, the greed which Anakin moves towards the dark side and is actually consumed by the dark side. As we have as we learned in, in the earlier episodes, the ones that were released first, episodes four through six, Vader was Anakin Skywalker, but he was overtaken by the dark side. Thus, he no longer remained, but he was taken over by Darth Vader, the Sith that Anakin would become when he turned to the dark side. As we see this now in all the stories, episode one, Anakin is a slave. We meet Padme Amidala, of course, who is the queen of Nebu. And then, of course, in episode two, she is the senator, a senator from Nebu. A lot of politics in these Star Wars episodes, particularly in the prequels, as the characters live in a world of politics, and they live surrounded by political entities, people motivated by political gain and to seek power. And then we learn more about the dark side, and then, of course, we learn even more about the Force. So as we go on through the prequels, the original trilogy, the characters that we meet, Keep in mind, these stories are just stories, friends. And if you want a way to look at them, take a look. Look at them for yourself. If you enjoy the prequels, great. If they're not your thing, super. All ideas are welcome. All input is invited. We will have great respect for the leader of this entire program, the master that gave us all of this, George Lucas. And he is the master. He's the creator of this universe. And we, together, as an audience reading this text, Studying this sacred text, if you will, Star Wars. Looking at the prequels, the original trilogy, including the holiday special, and also the Clone Wars, the original miniseries. We'll look at the words and the concepts as they are articulated by George Lucas and the various team members on the production team, including Rick McCollum. And we look forward to your words, your participation, and your ideas. The prequels, Star Wars, the original trilogy. And I am your host, Mr. The Prequels. We look forward to joining this conversation and having you as a part of it. May the Force be with us. On the subject of The Phantom Menace by George Lucas. Written and directed by George Lucas. The Phantom Menace. First of all, starting off, The Phantom Menace is an all-time classic masterpiece in every category, including casting, story, plot, storytelling, special effects, camera work, lighting, audio, not to mention direction and innovations in and pushing the boundaries of even what is possible of the technology to make a movie like this. The Phantom Menace is an all-time masterpiece. Written and directed by George Lucas. Producer Rick McCollum. Yeah, Rick McCollum, 10 out of 10, baby. So that's where I'm starting out here on this one. Absolute all-time classic. Phantom Menace all-time masterpiece. Taking it from the beginning, the opening title crawl, and then laying out the general premise and outline as well as progression of and pacing of this story, this fantastic story, this fantastic galaxy spanning adventure story, The Phantom Menace. This is episode one in the original complete saga, the Star Wars saga, by writer-director George Lucas. Lucasfilm Limited and 20th Century Fox are the studios involved in that, that particular episode, The Phantom Menace. And then, of course, Disney, worldwide corporation Disney, now owns Star Wars as the copyright trademark and all of that business. Google it. Yeah, Google it. But we're looking at the original story as this story has been delivered to us by the original creator of this saga, this epic tale of Star Wars, and that creator is George Lucas, the master of this universe, the creator of this entire thing, George Lucas. And so we're looking at the original complete saga as delivered to us by George Lucas, including the special editions, the original trilogy, the holiday special, and Clone Wars, the original miniseries. Clone Wars, the original hand-drawn miniseries. Or at least it looks hand-drawn. And so we're going to be looking at all of this, including the EU legacy, as well as a lot of the other books and comics. And then, of course, the rest of the TV shows and series. And every part of Star Wars that is now become ubiquitously integral to our society, including modern innovations in cell phone technology, TV, and movie screening devices. George R. Banks is truly the key to all of this. 
Yeah, not only is Jar Jar the funniest character we've ever had in Star Wars, Jar Jar is totally hilarious, absolutely overwhelmingly hilarious. Jarring to the power of two and double and beyond. Jar Jar Binks, Jar Jar is the key. And George Lucas is the key, as you will see, as we will see now in this The Phantom Menace. So you know my starting point on this. The Phantom Menace, the prequels, all-time masterpiece. Not only for Star Wars, as in the masterpiece of Star Wars and the Star Wars universe, but just a flat-out masterpiece of film and storytelling. Innovating, inventing, collaborating, pulling together various resources and perspectives and ways of painting a picture with texture and depth, as well as philosophy and abstract theorization. Not to mention a cast of characters straight out of Looney Tunes. Jar Jar really is the key to getting this whole thing, as he is not only the funniest character we've ever seen in Star Wars, but he really is quite articulate. And uh, very much an insightful point of view from the every person, so to speak, the every man. Yeah, Jar Jar is the every person in the room. He's every person that ever wanted to go on an adventure with the Jedi, but then found out that it's so full of action, adventure, danger, risk, exhilarating, ups and highs and lows, that uh, it's quite scary sometimes. But we learn from Jar Jar the view of the Jedi and of the society for a, a personality and a vision that we haven't yet seen in Star Wars. The every person view. So, as we wrap up today's episode, let me remind you that we're talking about and observing, critiquing, if you will, The Phantom Menace by George Lucas. And my position, The Phantom Menace is an all-time masterpiece. And Jake Lloyd deserves an Oscar for Anakin Skywalker in The Phantom Menace. The prequels is the best of Star Wars, friends. And I am your host, Mr. The Prequels. May the Force be with us. We'll see you next time. Jar Jar is the key man. <laughs> There's a lot of politics in the Phantom Menace. Talking senators, the Senate, procedure, whether something is legal or not, according to the Senate. George Lucas has laid out this world, the world of Star Wars, from one end of the galaxy to the other end of the galaxy. And there are outlying systems, and then, of course, the seat of government, Coruscant, the planet Coruscant, that is one giant city. And we see this web, this fabric of political machinations, elected representatives, elected rulers, queens, so to speak, the Supreme Chancellor, trade disputes, blockades, the Senate being bogged down in procedure, as we've said, the outline and formation of the body of the Republic, the Phantom Menace, written and directed by George Lucas, a masterful epic, a masterpiece, in fact. From the casting to the script, to the story, lights, camera, audio, and so on, and hundreds, if not thousands, of staff, production staff, worldwide, working together to bring us this movie. Groundbreaking special effects that serve, these special effects that serve, to bring us the story. And this story is the beginning of the Star Wars saga. Every story has a beginning. And then you have Watto, bringing in one of the characters here that we meet in the Phantom Menace, a businessman, a high roller, if you will. Watto is a parts dealer on Tatooine in the spaceport where the Jedi and Queen Amidala and her group that is coming from leaving Naboo, as Naboo has been invaded by the droid army of the Trade Federation after the setting up this blockade around Naboo. And this comes from taxation of trade routes. Turmoil has engulfed the galaxy. And while the Senate endlessly debates this turn of events, the Supreme Chancellor has dispatched two Jedi Knights to intervene and negotiate a cessation of this invasion blockade. Of course, it's not an invasion yet. And then the Jedi are finding themselves in on Naboo through a series of events. And then, of course, they have, at this point, met Anakin on Tatooine, Anakin Skywalker. And in this pod race, where Qui-Gon, a very risky endeavor, places a bet on the pod race for Anakin to win, betting against Watto for Anakin's freedom. And Watto 
well, then let Anakin go free. And then, of course, we see the Jedi mind trick, Qui-Gon's use of this mind trick. We see Qui-Gon Jinn's style of using the Force, and we understand his methods for using the Force, learning the Force, and practicing as a Jedi. We meet the Padawan learner at this point, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and we see the interaction, the relationship between Master and Apprentice, Master and Padawan learner. And then later we learn that through Sidious, Darth Sidious, a.k.a. the Chancellor, a.k.a. Chancellor Palpatine, as he puts it to Anakin in Episode 3, keeping in mind we're, we're talking about Episode 1, we're talking about the Phantom Menace, but in Episode 3, if you fast forward just a little bit, then the Chancellor tells Anakin that the Jedi and the Sith are similar in almost every way, and including in their way, their way of seeking to obtain greater power, their quest for greater power, according to Chancellor Palpatine, a.k.a. Darth Sidious, in Episode 3. But now, in Episode 1, we're just being introduced to this whole world. The politics, this idea that there are planets and systems on the Outer Rim where the Republic has no say. For instance, the Republic's anti-slavery laws, anti-slavery laws, do not apply to people living on Tatooine. And this comes as a surprise to Padme, Amidala. So, we see the differences and the ways of traversing this galaxy and the systems within the galaxy. It's a seat of your pants adventure, a thrill ride. It's the story of three people, mainly Qui-Gon, Qui-Gon Jinn, the trainer, the master, the teacher, Obi-Wan Kenobi, the learner, the student, the Padawan, the young Padawan learner, and of course, Anakin Skywalker, the slave. And also, with the midichlorian count, in his bloodstream, in Anakin's bloodstream, we learn that the Force is strong with Anakin. And this plays out in, in, in uh, further ways, in episode, going on into Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, and then, of course, Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. And we follow along these chapters. Chapter 1, we meet Anakin. Chapter 2, we see Anakin as he's becoming a Jedi, and as he is becoming more and more powerful as a Jedi, and dealing with the emotions and the pressures of being an adolescent, growing up through the Jedi system, never actually being allowed to be a child, if you think of it in those terms. Training to be a Jedi from the age of 10 years old, I believe. And then, of course, eventually, Anakin turns completely to the dark side, but we see the beginning of this turn in Episode 2, as especially in this case where, in the instance where Anakin slaughtered all of the sand people because of his hatred and as he was winning because of the loss of his mom and his mom's death and so he killed everyone including as he said not just the men but the women and the children and then he said I hate them they're like animals and so I slaughtered them like animals I hate them and then of course in Revenge of the Sith episode 3 we see the little boy then teenager in his 20s growing up in his 20s as a Jedi and then episode 3 in order to save the ones he loves that he foresees or perceives will die tragically or is too soon Anakin turns to the dark side and thus becomes Darth Vader and then of course we pick up on that in the original trilogy episodes 4, 5, and 6 to the ultimate resolution of the conflict within him within Anakin as the son then becomes the means for the father Anakin to be redeemed as we see that in episode 3 Anakin is the father of two children Luke and Leia as these were children named by Padme as she was giving birth to these two children and you know of course Padme is secretly married to Anakin because the code of the Jedi forbids attachment in that sense of being married especially in all of this we see the culture and the training and the expectations and the standard of the Jedi put upon, thrust upon Anakin, if you will, from the time he was a child, to lead Anakin actually to the dark side, as the Jedi are blinded by their arrogance, as to not even see within themselves the fault of the flaw that could be turning others to the dark side. So, we meet these characters in episode one, we see the world, it's, it's political, it's full of tech, high tech, machines designed for war, and the political maneuverings and manipulations behind the scenes that is the Phantom Menace. And of course we meet Jar Jar Banks, who's the funniest of all characters we've ever had in any of these movies, one of the all-time classic 
film greats, Jar Jar Binks. And Jar Jar is the key, as you will see. But also, if you will be able to get Jar Jar, you will be able to get The Phantom Menace. The Phantom Menace is a seat of your pants thriller. Galaxy spanning adventure. It takes place in space on a planet that is one entire city covering the entire planet. A planet that is lushly vegetated, covered with green trees and forests, as well as underwater cities and civilizations of, of beings that live underwater, these Duncans, so, so on. And then on to Tatooine, the desert planet, where we also encounter Darth Maul, and of course Obi-Wan eventually stops Darth Maul and kills Darth Maul, as we see in this one. Darth Maul will later come back later in some of the other versions of the story. But we know then from the Phantom Menace that as then Darth Maul killed Qui-Gon, who is Obi-Wan's master, trainer, teacher. Then Obi-Wan kills Darth Maul. And then there's a celebration in uh, Naboo, the capital to see the third government. And they proclaim peace between the Gungans and the Naboo. And there we have The Phantom Menace by George Lucas, written and directed by George Lucas, an all-time epic masterpiece. And that's all the time we have for today. May the Force be with us, and we'll see you next time. Jar Jar is the key, man. Ha, ha, ha.